you and I, we actually started talking about alternative investments and digital assets in particular. Um, I think it was uh, maybe summer of 21 or uh, was it 2020? I forget. But we kind of described the big picture back then as artificial bloated and overdue mm -hmm. and um, you know there was obviously where we see the change now is we had ultra loose monetary policies and fiscal policies for a long time we had um, you know excessive public and private debt as a consequence financial market imbalances and, and very topish markets which we've now seen some corrections now we have rising inflation and interest rates and that all of that has been accompanied by other big changes including a global economy that is slowing uh, we have negative demographics, uh, not just in the West. China, for example, is is hugely mm -hmm. affected by that. It's one of the big problems they're dealing with. Uh, an energy crisis in the West due to some of the energy policies and strategies. Um, growing geopolitical and social tensions and also a confluence of new technologies and innovations. So that was kind of the big context or the big picture backdrop that we kind of saw and said, you know, this would be an interesting time to start and uh, look into building something in the alternatives space. And what then came out of that was really uh, alt alpha strategies to some degree. Mm -hmm. And um, maybe in your words, uh, alt alpha strategies, if you describe the idea or what the vision is for alt alpha strategies, what how would you describe that? Yeah, I mean, high level, I would say giving access to alternatives which are maybe not accessible for most people in a very professional and diversified way to literally participate in the huge upside uh, which is in these new emerging fields in a very uh, uh, high level um, perspective and then additionally I mean starting maybe with uh, digital assets I mean I think if you believe in a world which is becoming more and more digital, which is, I think, happening all around us, and if you also follow a little bit the developments of, of the web in the early days, let's call it web 1.0 and then the web 2.0, web 3.0, I think the digitization of assets, of money, of everything which goes beyond information is a natural evolvement of what started with the digital revolution. And that there's maybe something alternative to the traditional monetary system which is based on many things but definitely not on a digital revolution i think that's for me quite obvious and from this perspective what started with bitcoin and is now evolving with all kind of different uh, digital asset projects is, is for me just a natural evolvement from from this digital uh, revolution so if you believe in uh, the continuous development in this field, I think you somehow have to have exposure into this space. And uh, again, I think everybody should read the white paper of Satoshi Nakamoto to understand a little bit what's behind and then maybe get some exposure. And the next step, if you're looking for alpha, um, is alternative alpha in the digital asset space. So mm -hmm. alt alpha digital is maybe the best explanation of this specific product. Yeah. So literally have somebody uh, screening all these um, alternative uh, asset managers generating alpha based on all kind of interesting strategies and then going further from the digital space to the traditional, uh, traditional space. I mean hedge funds also something. Um, you have many perceptions um, but I think just looking at the facts it makes sense that you have a certain allocation in this field. So that's then the reason for the other product for all weather exactly yeah. the all weather product and then gold as maybe the most uh, traditional and well-known uh, asset in the alt alpha universe also something which just makes sense to have a uh, allocation uh, in the portfolio so then literally you cover from the most traditional to the maybe most exciting field um, everything which is happening in this alternative space yeah, if we look at, I mean, those three funds that we've created, and we won't, uh, we don't want to make this, uh, you know, a marketing event too much. But Alt Alpha Strategies basically has started and launched with uh, three funds: the Alt Alpha Digital, the second one is Alt Alpha All Weather, and the third one is the Integrity Gold Fund. And it's ultimately what we were trying to do is to create, like you said, kind of a portfolio and array that is suited well for that new era. 
and the new era to some degree is going to be harder to invest in. Um, and so basically we're covering with the Alta Alpha Digital something which is, um, you know, in terms of risk profile is more speculative. All weather is really in the moderate zone where it's, it's performed at low volatility and creates very steady returns since 2018. Last year too, I think uh, the fund closed with around 7% uh, plus, not negative. And then Integrity Gold, um, you could say, well, who needs another gold fund? But there too, we're being innovative in a sense that there are a lot of gold funds out there. Um, some of them have big claims. You know, First of all, they certainly say they're fully backed by gold. That is not always completely <coughs> true. Um, there's also other, you know, marketing positioning pieces where they say they have, uh, you know, gold that is green or it's ESG and so on. The problem with those products is that very often they're not really that transparent. So what we're doing with that fund, again, something innovative is to show that um, using the technology of Exedras to show each bar in the fund and actually being able to drill down into the details of that gold bar where did it come from who produced it and so on so that's kind of the array of, of funds that we've created for for that new era that sounds and, uh, integrity in the name is not just a a nice label it's really explaining what's in it right so correct. that's why yeah yeah, yeah for me it's the sense. product integrity <laughs> is something basically um there's so much greenwashing and, and marketing out there and uh, product integrity in my view um, is something which can not be defined as a as a black and white truth. It's it basically comes down to doing and delivering what you're promising. So what you say on the packaging should also be inside, and that's that's what we've done with that gold yeah. fund. So that's Alta Alpha strategies, and now we'll go back into more general discussion of of uh, digital assets and maybe also the Alta Alpha digital investment strategy mm -hmm. and um, there maybe to, to start off I mean with uh, with uh, digital assets in general I think um, maybe just stepping stepping out one moment you had that conference that, that crypto finance conference mm -hmm. in St. Moritz mm -hmm. recently um, 2022 was not such a great was not such a great year yeah. what was the mood up there what was the outlook and maybe the Basically, the concerns are also the opportunities ahead. Yeah, I mean, I have to say we started this format five years ago. So literally January 2018 was the first event in the midst of the ICO craziness, right? And uh, have a quite specific positioning. So only investors you have to apply, very selective. So I would say people in St. Moritz at our conference are mostly heavy believers, right? So it's maybe not the no neutral and objective overview of the market but yeah. i have to say and now i mean the last few weeks we had a certain positive developments right in the space but separate from that um it was extremely positive because some of these negative happenings which are bad for the whole market in the short term but maybe will help to uh, further professionalize the whole ecosystem right because you had too much leverage still too many short-term oriented investors which are still not really understanding the underlying potential of everything in the space so that's why the the crowd and the investors we we had in st Moritz were, were really very positive because they have a true understanding and belief that it's the beginning of something new mm. so that's why yeah i was also surprised that there was not a yeah more. so it wasn't it wasn't a funeral it was still a, a it bit was of really a party very, very yeah. positive yeah. and uh, yeah. during the day and also in the night there was not not really a, a negative sentiment in the air which was also a little bit confirmed by some of the journalists which were also That's surprised. very telling yeah. yeah i mean to some degree you've been here before and uh, some of those yeah. other investors as well i mean to what degree are you reminded of what happened back at y2k and you know other other, other yeah, periods it's a, where I it's think just... it's a, it's a maybe natural development that you have these over exaggerations and these hype cycles. I think in crypto, what's unique, it's just on steroids and far <laughs> faster, right? So sometimes people say what you experience uh, in a month is like in a year in every other industry, right? So mm. it's extremely fast moving and maybe also because everybody has somehow a possibility to be part of this sometimes really crazy developments. 
that it's maybe a little bit too broadly covered and followed mm -hmm. because in the early days of the internet you also had these IPOs but it was still not something where everybody was somehow involved and with crypto I think there are still a lot of people who somehow jump on the bandwagon before try to understand what's really happening in the space. Um, coming coming back from Sankt Moritz, what in in your view, like who you know, what are the big trends or use cases that that were discussed up there or seen as like the next? Yeah, I mean, what's definitely step? becoming now because it was always mentioned, but I think the development uh, was a little bit lacking behind that you really have this convergence of the traditional world and the digital asset world. Mm -hmm. I mean, we already had some well-known hedge fund managers in the past, but now it's really becoming an uh, incremental part of the whole industry, right? That you have fully regulated, well-respected, very successful asset managers, uh, funds and other traditional players, including government uh, institutions, right, which are really understanding that the whole uh, development goes far further than the short term price of an underlying. It's really about the potential behind. Mm -hmm. And I think also this paradigm shift that the, the Western world somehow doesn't see the long term value of a decentralized, not government backed uh, monetary system is a uh, completely different as soon as you leave uh, Western Europe, right? Because you have still billions of people which have no access to literally uh, build savings or be part of the traditional financial services system. Mm -hmm. Even in a digital world, right? Uh, it's still a huge problem with the unbanked uh, all over the world. And I think digital assets for the first time ever uh, open an alternative way to somehow, yeah, be part of something and build wealth uh, for the next generations. And I think this, this use case, which is becoming far more tangible, uh, is also becoming more visible maybe for people who only saw the short-term speculation in it. I think um, I'm completely with you and I think where we agree is that there's, there's huge potential in um, blockchain technology and also digital assets and what you just said I think is really important for people to understand is that digital assets and the world of cryptocurrencies and and uh, tokens is really starting to merge with the traditional world and that process is underway so our position I think our joint position is we want to be part of that story and uh, the question I guess for investors then is how do I take part in that uh, apart from you know going into Bitcoin and Ethereum and and uh, also really being, you know, exposed basically to, to all that volatility. And that's kind of where our, our investment approach is, has evolved. Exactly. And I mean, like in non-digital asset uh, spaces, right? You can always try to identify uh, the winners, but then you're more like a venture capital investor, right? With all the risks and, and, and upsides attached. Or you try to identify serious counterparties which literally do the job for you and give you to a certain expand, uh, exposure uh, to these exciting developments. So these active managers, exactly. these talent, it kind of reminds us of uh, what we had back when the hedge funds started originally, yeah. in traditional field. Now it's, now it's the same thing in digital assets. So, so what our approach, I guess, was is to say, let's, let's find that talent and, and invest with those for active management to have a diversified portfolio of those digital asset hedge funds. Exactly, um, yeah. What's so that that approach of that fund of funds approach? Where do you see the benefits of that? You know, why why is that a better approach than kind of trying to to do it ourselves or to have a manage uh, to have a management strategy or an investment strategy that uh, goes directly into those different assets? I mean, honestly, also in my own case, I invested in in crypto funds. Uh, I mean, my first one was I think in two thousand seventeen. Back then, there were not that many <laughs> regulated ones. And it just needs a lot of time, right? I mean, because now you have hundreds of, uh, of fund managers and we only talk about uh, the hedge fund ones, right? So if you do the whole venture capital, I think you can talk about thousands, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, it just takes a lot of time to, because instead of screening the companies uh, or individual strategies, you then screen the funds behind, right? Which is sometimes even more complex, I would say. 
um, because it's not just a gut feeling that the founder is a passionate entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. So literally taking this job and giving it to somebody who literally in a full professional way only talks to these managers is already a huge added value. And then on the other side, I still have a, a location into several funds, but it's not in a really diversified way, right? I don't have, that's also a job of the fund of fund manager, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That you have a smart allocation and a distribution into several strategies, which ultimately also help you to hedge risk. Ideally take the full upside, but also limit the downside. Mm -hmm. And uh, literally it's a full-time job, right? So that's why if you're not really fully uh, involved in the space and have nothing else to do, I think it doesn't really make sense to build your portfolio yourself, right? Yeah, I agree. I think there's there's several constraints and limitations and one of them is liquidity, the other one is access. Um, if we look at what we've done now with uh, Alt Alpha Digital is really um, to use a an investment process, a professional investment process that we've used and tested for quite a few years in the in the traditional, yeah, the traditional hedge funds space, area yeah. and now we've kind of converted that the difference i think and and that's where it's it's great working with you in that project is that um it's harder you know with the with the traditional hedge funds you can find those hedge funds on bloomberg you know you can do filterings and mm. rankings and and um in the crypto context or digital asset context those funds are not that transparent yet you know you don't really have that access and that level of information yet. So it's sometimes we talk about in German, it's the Trüffelschwein mm. approach, right? Mm. <laughs> where, yeah, yeah. where basically um, you are in that network and you know you get to know those managers. And that's really currently still extremely important for that sphere so that we can find the, the nuggets for the future, right? Yeah, and I think, I mean, as you said, it's still not in a way institutionalized that you have the mm. same terminals or access points where you just find the best managers. A lot of them are quite new. They're literally starting uh, like everybody from zero. They don't have huge assets yet, but they still have solid track record and uh, professional setups, yeah. but it's difficult to identify the ones. And as we all know, just because you're the loudest one doing marketing doesn't automatically mean that you also generate long-term alpha. Yeah. And I think that's also a very crucial role. So a lot of my uh, friends investing individual funds with stellar performance after some of the happenings last year literally lost everything mm -hmm. because there was not a proper risk management or everything installed. Mm -hmm. So these red flags, and I think that's also a big part of the fund selection process, you have to find the best ones but you also have to eliminate the ones who have a red flag and as an individual investor you normally, again if you don't have unlimited resources, you maybe don't find these red flags in a traditional due diligence. And that's where the benefits of diversification really come in in terms in terms of shielding you to some degree from from bad actors. You know, to uh, key person risk is something which I think that approach helps with uh, concentration risk. In our case, also, and I think there maybe we can get into that a bit. You know, how are we actually investing? Because one of the things we try to do, contrary to some of the more venture capital oriented strategies is also liquidity is very important mm -hmm. to us. And um, uh, the other aspect is uh, safety in terms of safe custody. So those two topics I think are, are also important and why we chose to, to go with a fund of funds approach. Because in our case, if you go with funds or a fund of fund approach, you don't have to worry about you know losing your private key. You don't have to take care of those custody aspects. Those are actually taken care of by, by those fund managers and custodians that they use. And so that's a big part of our due diligence process. Um, maybe to explain a bit like what we actually invest in, um, Mark and you, so Mark Seidel and, yeah. and so the other Mark and you, um, you often talk about, you know, structuring the portfolio with uh, offense, defense and kind of midfield. So, mm -hmm. you, you know, often using that, uh, that soccer uh, comparison. Can you explain that a bit, how, how we're doing that? Yeah, I mean, I have to say that was uh, Mark Seidel's uh, <laughs> invention, right? The soccer mm -hmm. team. Yeah. But it's maybe a good visualization of what we're doing. I mean, you have, like in other traditional asset classes and hedge funds, all kind of different strategies from an absolute return, uh, let's say, approach where you generate far higher uh, returns uh, than in traditional assets. 
but still have a quite predictable outcome to maybe more uh, yeah, risk-taking strategies, um, long, short and all kind. I mean, normally uh, I think leverage is not helping you in a market which is as volatile than uh, the whole digital asset space. But the idea is a little bit that we select a team based on the uh, soccer uh, uh, idea that you have a defense where you have the more conservative trading strategies. So those are more of the, I guess, the more the market neutral, <coughs> exactly, long, market short, neutral. and then uh, the, the long biased or long strategies are the exactly. more offensive ones. Exactly. Basically. Yeah. But still, I think you have to be cautious because, again, as crypto is far more volatile than, than other asset classes that maybe in the, in the offense you have to maybe cut the extreme cases just because you don't want to have double digit uh, positive or negative uh, performances every month, which is then just maybe not very sustainable from an from a investment perspective. Right. 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 But I think this um, approach of, of having different strategies in a, in a concentrated portfolio is exactly what makes the fund of fund uh, approach uh, very valuable because you don't have to go through all these hundred managers and because I mean just when you talk about the uh, uh, absolute return or market neutral I mean there are also dozens of different funds right so you can then just go through them to select one mm -hmm. or you have a, a portfolio where you cover among others these strategies right yeah it's it's What's also different to the traditional hedge funds, which you know I've I've been active in, is is really the fact that you're also looking at much younger players mm -hmm. and smaller funds. The uh, the amount of investment that a portfolio, you know, ours included, go puts into digital assets, I think, is still a, a small portion mm -hmm. of your overall invested portfolio, and um, so therefore the the funds that we're looking at. Tend to be much smaller than those big hedge funds that we use in you know in the all weather, which which you know have been around for decades in some cases. Whereas here we're looking at younger players, so it's being close to those players, knowing those managers, knowing the scene, and really understanding what they're doing is a challenge. And that's really what uh, what you and and Mark Seidel in particular are, are taking care of. And then Dirk Steinhoff and I, we kind of take care of more of that due diligence and. Uh, kind of the old guy approach mm -hmm. and, and making sure that there's discipline in the, in the investment mm -hmm. process. So it is, it is quite involved. One of the things that we discussed quite a bit in the beginning was like, what do we actually mean by digital assets? What are we actually investing in? And I think that's, maybe we can touch on that a bit. Um, you know, if we go through some of the themes and uh, you know, that we, that we're going into in these discretionary, in these um, discretionary strategies, one that will be obvious, and, and there we're now going beyond cryptocurrency, right? Because everyone is talking about Bitcoin and Ethereum and those other cryptocurrencies, including now CBDCs and stable coins. Um, but the strategies or, or stories that we're investing in is much broader. So one area, for example, to discuss that everyone probably is aware of is the payment infrastructure. So basically the... Uh, you know, the global remittance system, for example. Can you elaborate a bit on, on that example, on that use case? Yeah, I mean, ultimately, that's um, exactly what you um, mentioned um, in the beginning of, of, of the talk, right? That, I mean, you have the cryptocurrency element and they're mainly the, the, the uh, foundation of Bitcoin. And then you have the blockchain technology, which goes far further, right? Which is sometimes even unrelated to the currency space because you solve different problems and pain points mm -hmm. and I think for the payment field specifically yeah, I mean you have still a quite traditional way of exchanging uh, money or assets all over the world uh, T plus whatever right in the worst <laughs> case and if it's weak and nothing happens and I think there I think uh, it's obvious that this, that, that this will change completely and uh, I mean, with Axedras, you also, to a certain extent, cover a uh, use case, which More is of also supply helping chain exactly management the supply chain case. field, yeah. where I also yeah. see huge potential. But yeah, you have some infrastructures based on traditional uh, infrastructures and uh, legacy, especially, um, which are established, uh, but which should be also questioned, maybe, because mm -hmm. they make 
sometimes quite simple and straightforward processes, extremely inefficient and expensive. Mm -hmm. And I think their blockchain technology can solve uh, and increase efficiency quite dramatically. So and payment and, and supply chain, I think, are two of these very obvious fields. Others that we're invested in is uh, decentralized finance. So, for example, peer-to-peer -peer borrowing and lending, uh, gaming. I think is something that that you and Mark are, are quite interested mm -hmm. in. Also, um, sports, entertainment, blockchain, interoperability. That's a that's a big one. I think. I don't know. Do we want to elaborate on that a little bit? The yeah, I mean, maybe also from a big picture. I mean, that you have a centralized platform which is literally getting all the value and in a certain dependency for the users. I think that's also something which is the status of the web 2.0 and I think that's also not a bad thing some of the biggest tech companies their business model is based on this centralized infrastructure but when you look at the progress of technology and the opportunities decentralized uh, solutions are offering nowadays I think it's also obvious that part of this business will literally move in a in a more open and uh, decentralized world and I mean we talked about the uh, the example of Facebook taking over the whole uh, party space, right? <laughs> I mean, nowadays the question is uh, how relevant is Facebook? I mean, they did a few smart acquisitions, but I think the core business model mm -hmm. of Facebook is heavily questioned. And one of these drivers um, are these new ways of how you want to exchange information, how you want to store um, your literally virtual uh, identity, right? And that's why. I mean, that's uh, just reality in tech. You have these fast moving cycles. And I think one of the biggest cycles, which is literally right ahead of us, is that uh, you have a shift from centralized institutions to decentralized ones, which is also maybe just the next stage of the digital revolution. And I think their blockchain and some of the use cases you just mentioned um, will, will play a crucial role. <laughs>